And good afternoon, everyone, from St. Louis, Missouri, and the home of the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. My name is Tom Pansella with MIMH. Thanks for taking the time to join us this afternoon. I'll introduce our speakers to you in just a moment. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. For those of you who've been here before, welcome back. You'll see the video window that's prominent on the screen. Just below that, you'll see our caption window. We welcome our captioner on board today. And that'll give you the opportunity to follow along with a live transcript of the program. Also, on the right side of that, if you have any questions or any other feedback, feel free to enter that into the chat window to the right there, and that'll, that'll give us the opportunity to ask those questions on your behalf. We'll probably hold questions to the end, but you can submit questions at any time during the presentations. Also below the, the caption window, you'll see a link to the speaker's slides as a PDF file. If you like, you can pop those up in a separate video window to, to follow along yourself. You'll also see them on the screen during the presentation. Below that, you'll also see a link to purchase CEUs if you're interested in purchasing CEUs for today's program. Still only $10 a person for that. And finally, below that, you'll see our links to our Spring Training Institute. We're always plugging that. So if you're anywhere in or around Missouri the week after Memorial Day, Take a look at the Spring Training Institute. It's two days of a really good training program. So now I'd like to introduce Joan Masters and Dan Riley. Joan is the Senior Coordinator for Missouri Partners in Prevention. She's responsible for the training and technical assistance that PIP provides. She provides oversight to the Partners in Prevention projects such as the Missouri College Health Behavior Survey and the Problem Gambling and Suicide and Mental Health Grants, including Ask, Listen, Refer Online program, which we're going to be talking about today. Dan is the Prevention and Research Coordinator for Missouri Partners in Prevention. In addition to assisting with trainers and member services, he oversees the research and evaluations of Partners in Prevention, providing technical assistance with survey implementation and data analysis for all of their projects. Joan, Dan, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> so Missouri Partners in Prevention is a state-funded, Department of Mental Health-funded organization that is the a coalition of 21 universities in the state of Missouri. And as part of our mission, our, we hope to create healthier and safer college campuses across the state. And one of our programs that we have um, that is uh, very successful is our suicide prevention program that's funded by the Department of Mental Health and the uh, National SAMHSA. One program that we've developed uh, about five years ago was our online Ask, Listen, Refer suicide prevention tutorial that's available for campuses across the state. Recently, we had the an opportunity to make this program available to all Missourians, not just those in the higher education settings. And so we're here to talk to you today about the success of our Ask, Listen, Refer program, the reasons why we designed it the way that we did, and also to tell you more about the Missouri Suicide Prevention Program and to um, give a better sense of uh, why you might be interested in implementing the Missouri Ask, Listen, Refer Program um, in your campus, in your community, or in your social organization. Just a brief outline of what we'll be talking about today. Um, we will start by talking a little bit about the extent of the problem of youth and college suicide. Um, <clears throat> we will talk a little bit about a model that we use as the basis for why we designed the program that, um, that we did, and then tell you a little bit about the Missouri Ask, Listen, Refer program. Just to give an extent of uh, suicide in the state of Missouri, <clears throat> Suicides outnumbered homicides by almost two to one in 2009. And among youth ages 15 to 24, suicide was the leading cause of death. The suicide rate in Missouri is higher than the national suicide rate. And therefore, um, this certainly causes concern and something that we want to address among our youth. <clears throat> we also know that um, data from the Missouri Institute of Mental Health indicates that about 15% of all Missouri high school students and about 20% of those female high school students reported that they seriously considered suicide in 2009. Um, we uh, at Missouri Partners in Prevention, because we are inheriting those students who are high school students um, in their youth ages into our college setting, we are not only concerned about suicide in the higher education communities that we serve, but also in the youth communities in the state of Missouri. Um, just a sense in terms of youth suicide and means. The means by which individuals take their lives certainly de depends on their age and gender, but the use of firearms is the primary means of suicide among, in, in Missouri among both youth and adults. 
And from 2000 to 2007, around half of all suicides among youth ages 15 to 24 were due to firearms, followed by suffocation and poisoning. Um, and we also know that in Missouri, younger youth are more likely to use suffocation than firearms. Um, while this doesn't necessarily, um, this data doesn't necessarily change the way that we do our training in Ask, Listen, Refer, it helps us understand the overall um, prevalence of suicide in Missouri. Um, we now are going to transition to some slides talking about uh, college students and suicide based on some federal and uh, statewide data that we've collected through Missouri Partners in Prevention. So what we're finding nationally uh, is that suicide is the second leading cause of death among college students. Um, and while that is concerning, we've also find that it's even higher among our college age um, non-attending peers. Um, sadly, approximately 1,100 students, um, college students die by suicide each year. And we have a lot of different sources of data collection. Uh, one of our sources on a specific campus at the University of Missouri in Columbia in 2012, we found that about 14% of our students thought about suicide in the past year and seven percent thought about it in the past month. Uh, so at least on one campus we're seeing um, the numbers reflecting the national averages and something that we really need to be concerned about. Uh, as I mentioned we do um, uh, several surveys. The previous survey I mentioned is a wellness survey uh, which is um, implemented in the spring semester um, and we uh, uh, implement that program um, on an annual base at, basis at, on one of our campuses. Um, through the Missouri Partners in Prevention, uh, which is, um, a, as Joan alluded to, is, is uh, the uh, coalition of uh, 21 campuses through our state, we also provide an online survey in the spring semester at 21 different campuses. Uh, we get close to 10,000 responses uh, with an overall response rate of about 25%. On that survey, we ask about a lot of student behaviors, uh, particularly health behaviors, including alcohol, drug use, suicide, uh, mental health, tobacco, gambling, um, and risky driving. According to the, uh, our most recent survey, which was implemented last year, uh, once again, we see about 14% of our college students um, experiencing suicidal thoughts or gestures within the past um, year, past 12 months. Um, we also notice that we have some um, target populations that have um, um, specifically a much larger um, percentages of um, risk. Um, we have found that our LGBTQ students are at higher risk of suicide with thoughts of suicide at about 36 uh, percent compared to that 14 percent that we previously mentioned. Um, and the other, um, while this is preliminary data, we're also finding that some of our par target populations, um, the problem may be getting more intense with, uh, we're seeing, um, uh, while we see a, uh, a very um, documented increase in suicidal thoughts with our LGBTQ students uh, two th in 2010 and 2011, for some reason there has been a spike in 2012 and we want to find out more about that. Um, and likewise, we also see an alarming um, increase uh, generally with our LGBTQ students compared to non-LGBTQ students with suicide attempts. And uh, no, once again, a particular spike in those concerns in the past year. Um, so a lot of this data collection allows us to look at uh, general rates and also um, population rates. So we're looking at different... Um, uh, students uh, such as LGBTQ students were gathering more information on our student veterans and also trying to identify other populations that we may not have been looking at before that may be at particular risk for suicidal thoughts and suicidal actions. When we first started Access and Refer, the online training program, um, we inherited uh, the program through uh, the University of Central Missouri had actually started an online training program that became the basis for Ask, Listen, Refer. And they cooperated with us in providing that training program and we were able to, through a grant from the Missouri Foundation for Health, provide the training in a uh, very, um, a, a much more widespread way than the University of Central Missouri was able to provide to their community. So um, 
when we did that, we started thinking about specifically um, changing the program to be able to really look at the cause, the risk factors for suicide, and understanding why students die by suicide, and making sure that that knowledge uh, maybe wasn't necessarily included in the training program, but became the basis for how we provided the specific training that we did. So I want to introduce to you a model. Um, Thomas Joyner um, is um, a research professor at the University of Florida who has a model of suicide risk. And to me, this model uh, makes a lot of sense when we look at designing interventions and, um, and the training programs that we do to address suicide prevention. What Dr. Joyner says is that wanting death is composed of two psychological experience. The perception of being a burden to others, which is called perceived burdensomeness, and social disconnection or thwarted belongingness, i.e., I'm worth more dead to the people that love me than I am alive, and I don't have a connection to something larger than myself. So on a college campus, we might see a particular student that does not see their worth um, in in terms of their family or their social group, but then they also um, not only don't feel the worth to that group, but then we, they also feel a disconnection, that they don't even have that um, available to them. And by, by themselves, neither of these things, somebody can feel that they're not connected or feel like they n don't necessarily um, have a worth to those people um, that, are, that are dear to them, but that doesn't necessarily make someone suicidal. However, the risk is elevated when these two factors overlap and when a desire for suicide is met with the ability to carry it out. So just looking at this model in an illustration, the perceived burdensomeness, which is the desire for suicide, and then the thwarted belongingness um, also intersects with the acquired capacity for suicide. And when those three things intersect, there's a higher risk for a suicide or completion or a serious attempt. Again, um, this model is not, um, and I've heard Dr. Joyner present on this model, it's not a perfect model and that someone maybe doesn't necessarily fit um, in all three categories. But to me, this makes a lot of sense. Someone has a desire. Um, they also don't feel connected to someone. Someone's maybe not uh, reaching out to them or they don't feel reached out to. But then they also have a, an acquired capacity for suicide. And let me tell you a little bit more about acquired capacity. Acquired capacity could be a series of painful or provocative experiences over the course of a, um, of a time period or a lifetime that disinhibits a person from the fear of pain and death associated with suicide. So that experience might be trauma and abuse in their childhood or in their adult life, uh, their, um, com their propensity to engage in high-risk behaviors, maybe such as alcohol or drug abuse or cutting. Uh, injuries from contact sports, so um, and certainly in our conversations nationally about um, uh, the, the link between head injury and mental illness, and a knowledge of and a comfort with deadly means of suicide. They have a high um, comfort with firearms. They use legal, lethal drugs commonly, and they use them for recreational use. So again, this doesn't necessarily mean at all that someone who is comfortable with firearms is a suicidal person, but when you look at the intersection of each of these three uh, categories, you see that somebody with that um, uh, that ability to carry out a suicide attempt, as well as feeling like they um, would like to make a suicide attempt, kind of creates a perfect storm for an individual. So when we look at um, that model, and we keep that model in mind, when we look at data that we know about if someone was having a suicidal thought, when we asked our uh, University of Missouri students in 2012, if you were having suicidal thoughts, who would you feel comfortable talking to about your thoughts? And the number one person that they would talk to would be a friend. So if that person is feeling the sense of thwarted belongingness or social disconnection, they might not feel comfortable talking to a friend. Um, in addition, they feel comfortable talking to family members, partners, boyfriends, or girlfriends. And that is all before talking with a mental professional or counseling center. What we find with many people is that they're comfortable eventually talking with a mental health professional or counseling professional, but that's only when before or first they've reached out to one of the um, persons in the first three categories. So when we keep this in mind about who people reach out to, 
Um, we try and design training programs that certainly are not geared towards mental health professionals because we feel like on college campuses at least and in the community that training programs exist for those individuals about suicide and suicidal ideation. But rather, how do we teach the friends, the family members, the partners or boyfriends and girlfriends to respond in a suicidal crisis? We also know when we ask students about how they get information about depression or suicide, they do say the internet, um, and which is a little bit scary when we think about what is available on the internet for people um, re related to mental illness. Some of it is very good uh, information, but some of it can be quite scary. So in an effort to reach out to the friends, the family members, and the partners, we knew that when we designed a training program, it needed to be likely in the ways that they accessed information which was on the internet. So we have a disconnect, um, what we see on college campuses, and this is at least in our field, and I think this is probably generalizable to the community as well, that nearly 80% of those students who die by suicide on college campuses never participate in counseling services. And what we would speculate is that they have that sense of thwarted belongingness, they have that sense of social disconnection, and therefore they don't reach out to the people that could get them in contact with those services, those gatekeepers and those first responders. We also know that on college campuses, and I would believe since this uh, data is from 2005, I would believe that recent efforts, especially in the state of Missouri, we would see a higher number than this now. But tw only 26% of college students on Westerfield survey um, had said that they were aware of their campus's mental health resources. So even if they wanted to connect, or even if they were not suicidal but they had a friend who was suicidal, how would they necessarily connect with, um, with resources that they didn't know existed? The Missouri Campus Suicide Prevention Project, to give you a paint a picture a little bit of um, who we are and how this came to be, uh, we are again a coalition of 21 Missouri universities and colleges. And uh, we make our services available not only to those 21 Missouri universities and colleges, but also to colleges and universities throughout the state. Our suicide prevention efforts are guided by a planning group of college counseling center directors across the state of Missouri. And we are funded by the Missouri Department of Mental Health Youth Suicide Prevention Project and, the, um, and SAMHSA, the Garrett Lee Smith Suicide Prevention Project. We have a comprehensive approach for suicide prevention, which includes our Ask, Listen, Refer training. We do our statewide assessment, our Missouri College Health Behavior Survey that Dan talked about earlier. We provide education to our campuses through poster campaigns and awareness events. We have our online suicide prevention training program, which is Ask, Listen, Refer. But we also encourage, encourage our campuses to have coalitions or groups of people working on this issue so that they can put policy into place, such as addressing means restriction or training about po our policies about training uh, key providers on college campuses um, and those gatekeepers, those first responders, such as friends, family members, staff in residence halls. So what does this necessarily mean for this webinar today? Uh, the Ask, Listen, Refer training program was begun five years ago, um, and it was originally de designed for students, faculty, and staff, at, and parents at colleges in Missouri, knowing that those are the people that most likely would be um, the first people to know about a student in a suicidal crisis, or um, they would be the first people who would ask even how they would know if someone was in a suicidal crisis. However, now um, we don't just serve the 21 campuses in the state of Missouri. We, ser we serve 31 campuses in the state and three colleges in Ohio. And we recently added um, a campus in New York um, as well. The sites, the Ask, Listen, Refer training sites, which we will show you in some screenshots a little bit later, are customized to each campus and include individual logins, which means that when a student at the University of Missouri logs into the University of Missouri Ask, Listen, Refer program, they get information that's designated specifically for them. The information about their college counseling center, the information about crisis resources in the city of Columbia where the university is located. That would be different for a student accessing the program from Truman State University. They would receive their own resources. We also provide participants a pre and post test and then follow up with all participants at three, six, and 12 months, which means we are able to uh, provide data, and we'll show that data within this webinar today, of how often uh, our participants are going back to the program. That's the reason why they, they have an individual login. Students uh, and faculty and staff and parents who take this program are able to revisit the information that they have learned. What we often find with 
uh, in-person training programs is that a student or a person that goes to an in-person training program only has a, s a snapshot of what the information is and then they have no way to go back and refresh their information that they're learning. And so with the online training program, they can do that at any time. We've often heard from professors that they will take the training program and not know how they would use the information, but then they log back into the program when they know a student is coming to talk to them and they're concerned about that student. It's easily accessible and it doesn't mean they have to find a paper in their file cabinet. Ask, Listen, Refer is a free online suicide prevention program designed to help the faculty, staff, and students prevent suicide. Uh, and we have three goals of the program. Um, in the program, students uh, of the program are taught to identify people at risk for suicide, to see what some of those warning factors and risk factors are, recognize the risk factors, the protective factors, meaning the things that are often um, help um, help a particular individual feel more connected and therefore um, less at risk for suicide, and uh, the warning signs for suicide among college students. And then it also teaches the people taking the ALR program to respond to and get help for people at risk. It literally walks them through three steps, how to ask if someone is thinking of harming themselves or dying by suicide, how to listen for their response and then refer them appropriately based on their answer. The applications for use for our Missouri Ask, Listen, Refer program. Uh, Missouri Ask, Listen, Refer, as I said at the top of the webinar, that we, um, we designed Missouri Ask, Listen, Refer as a, uh, a, after a call from the state of Missouri that the program was really benefiting the colleges and the higher education communities in the state but there was nothing for folks to use who were in the general community areas. Um, and so we designed the Missouri Ask, Listen, Refer program two years ago for elementary and secondary educational settings, youth groups and faith-based organizations, youth organizations, and really any Missourian uh, interested in learning more about how to ask, listen, refer. We suggest this program to groups uh, who work with youth in a variety of settings. Uh, we often uh, suggest to schools that parents uh, pr be provided this information because parents don't necessarily know. They know how to talk to their children about key issues and concerns, but maybe not about something as serious as that student interested in taking their life. So to use the Missouri Ask, Listen, Refer program, and our website is lo listed above, MissouriAskListenRefer.org or MoAskListenRefer.org, anyone can take the program, even those outside of the state of Missouri. Um, it does have Missouri data in that program, but anyone is welcome to use it. Uh, as a new user, you would go to our website listed above and create a login and password, and you'd take the pretest, view the slides, and then you could take the post-test and print a certificate, which is often helpful for those who are wanting to um, incentivize uh, groups of folks taking the program. For returning users, they'd simply log back into the website and um, review the content and reprint their certificate as necessary. I just want to walk you through a few screenshots so you know what the program looks like if you um, aren't able to log into it. Uh, this is our, a screenshot of our Create Account program. Um, essentially, we ask for a few details. We ask for name because that would be what is printed on the certificate. Um, we ask you to develop an email and a password associated with this. And then we ask um, a few um, key questions about what your role is so that we know where people are coming from the program and where we need to do more work um, at uh, letting folks know about this important training program. The program itself takes about 15 to 20 minutes depending on the program, uh, the person taking the program. And like I said before, it involves a pretest. So these tests, pretest and post tests, are not graded. The certificate at the end is not given based on the um, ability for someone to pass the post-test at the end. But it simply gives us, as well as the user, a sense of what maybe they don't know about suicide and mental health. Then it walks through a series of slides. Um, we have some slides about the demographics of suicide, uh, what the, um, the problem of suicide specifically is in Missouri and uh, for certain subpopulations, such as um, we break it down with statistics about race and ethnicity, as well as sexual orientation, lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth, um, et cetera. 
We also teach um, our students in Ask, Listen, Refer about the suicide continuum, about how someone can move from having a thought about suicide to attempting suicide, and where on that continuum they might be able to assist someone with getting help. And the answer to that question is that at any point on this continuum, we can get someone help. But maybe the way in which we get them help is different based on where they're at in the continuum. We tell, um, can, uh, we tell our students in Ask, Listen, Refer about the prevalence of suicide and uh, dispel some myths and facts about the issue itself. As you can see on the bottom of this slide, we include the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline um, on every slide in case someone is taking the program and needs to an ask a question right away of a person. And we recommend that National Suicide Prevention Lifeline throughout the program. Um, as you can see, this is um, some myths and facts information about the truth about suicide. It, it is uh, the, the program itself is written at a fifth grade reading level, and so um, and it is written for accessibility. And so what we find is that um, most people, dependent on um, uh, their how long it takes them to get through the program, but most people feel comfortable with the reading level and um, the way in which this program talks about suicide in a way that's not academic. Um, for the purposes of this webinar, we thought it would be useful to show some video examples. So this program itself provides um, the ability to learn about suicide, to learn about how to ask the question, are you thinking of ending your life? Are you thinking of harming yourself? Are you thinking of killing yourself? Um, but we can only explain that so much within the words of the training program. In order to take that a step further, there are four video examples, which you can view all of them on our YouTube channel. But we've provided one video example that we have used for the program um, that is um, an example of a counselor talking with a student about his specific concern about that student's suicidality. There are other three videos on Missouri Ask, Listen, Refer of a, are of a parent talking with a student and also of a student Con expressing concern about another student and a coworker expressing concern about a coworker. This here is the example of the counselor and the student talking with each other. I've been meeting with Anthony periodically throughout the past year to discuss his classes and college applications. And recently I noticed a few changes in his behavior. He seemed withdrawn when we met, uninterested in talking about his schoolwork or really anything at all. His mom called yesterday, concerned about Anthony, seemingly withdrawn at home too. And his teachers have shared he hasn't been completing much of his, his work over the past month. This morning I asked Anthony if he'd like to have lunch with me in my office. How's your day going so far? Fine, I guess. Have you registered for the June ACT like we discussed? No, I kind of forgot, but I think I'm going to study over the summer and start and take it next year. Okay. I think it's perfectly fine if you take the summer to prepare. But Anthony, honestly, I am a little concerned. Um, you're such a good student, and you've always been so prepared and motivated for college. But lately, you don't seem too motivated to do anything. What's going on? I don't know. I really don't care about anything anymore. It's hard to explain. Uh, I think it's perfectly natural to feel that way. But it, it seems like you've been feeling that way for quite some time now. And I, and I don't want your grades to decline. It's just, and, I, and I don't want you to continue to feel that way either. I don't know. It's just I don't really understand things anymore. Complicated. Have you thought about hurting yourself, uh, ending it all? I guess that'd be a lot easier. Anthony, I really want you to, to know and understand there's a lot of people at the school that care about you, and we want you to succeed, and ending it all definitely is not the answer. Would you mind if I invite Mrs. Johnson to come to lunch with us? She's an expert of helping students feel better emotionally. I guess that's fine. So that is an example of one of our videos that we have. All of our videos are about 1 minute 40 seconds. They're also available, like I said, on our YouTube channel. So should anyone want to show a video in a presentation that's separate from this, you're certainly welcome to use them. I find that they are, um, the videos show um, how someone can express sincerity, how they can ask the difficult question, are you thinking of harming yourself? But then also, um, it gives someone a role model to be able to look to um, who might not be able to pick up exactly on how to have that conversation by reading through the program, but then they can see it modeled in multiple videos. The other thing that we provide is uh, community resources for the state. So we include all of the um, crisis hotlines for the state of Missouri, 
as well as um, other crisis hotline locators and community resources. So this is an example of some of the slides from our Missouri Ask, Listen, Refer program. Now we're going to transition to a bit to tell you a little bit about our Ask, Listen, Refer college program and the data that we've had so that you can know more about um, the success that we hope to have with our Missouri Ask, Listen, Refer program for all Missourians. Well, first of all, I just want to mention we get, uh, gather a lot of data from a lot of dis different data points. So we use information from our Missouri College Health Behavior Survey to inform the development um, and uh, iterations of our um, both our Ask, Listen, Refer program on college campuses as well as the Missouri Ask, Listen, Listen, Refer, Listen and Refer. Um, so first of all, we wanted to find out from our students um, what levels of willingness they would have to uh, participate in the online um, training program um, and, and how much they have had concerns about their friends. And, and basically for the past three years we found that um, our students are very willing so um, to, uh, be, uh, to, to use the ALR program. Uh, so it, it really opens the door for much of it has to do with our marketing, getting that out to students, making it easy accessible because it's fairly clear that there's a good percentage of our students that are concerned about friends and there's a good percentage, or even a greater percentage of students that would be willing to take that training. Um, and one thing we have noticed is we have uh, had some success with increasing our knowledge of the ALR program in the past three years and hoping to see um, even uh, further increases um, in future years. Uh, so we see that our um, knowledge or heard of ALR has increased from 15% um, to almost 22% 20, in the past two years and we're hoping to mostly double that. So now, um, and also uh, we wanted to find out from our um, uh, Much BS survey as far as uh, students' likelihood of discuss, uh, discussing suicide and making referrals. And we see a little bit of a gap there that's uh, remained uh, fairly um, consistent in the past three years. Um, where, uh, and these are students who have not taken um, the program, but we're looking to um, increase the number of students who would be willing to bring up suicide um, and, and, and more, more so um, increasing the percentage of students that would be willing to make a referral. And we're going to continue to measure these numbers hopefully as we uh, hit more of a critical mass with a percentage of students that have taken ALR we'll start to see these numbers increase. But the other um, um, encouraging point that we've seen as of the beginning of this month just ran the numbers a couple of days ago we've had 9,000 students in our state uh, take the um, Ask, Listen, Refer um, statewide program. Okay, uh, so uh, of those 9,000 uh, or 9,000 individuals on our college campuses, the overwhelming majority of them are students followed by faculty and staff and we do have a small percentage, um, an encouraging percentage of parents that are taking part in this training pr uh, program. Um, and then the other thing as far as the pre-test and post-test at, um, at the time that they're actually taking it, we, get, we do some evaluation at that point to find out what is their knowledge and when have they received training on this topic before. And as you can see from the numbers, um, the overwhelming majority have never attended a, a workshop of this kind um, and, of, and about half have um, never had specifically training for suicide prevention. So the data shows pretty clear from our pretests and our, from our process that, um, uh, that uh, there is a great need for this and we need to have a lot more of our students um, exposed and hoping to expose more of our students to this training and also the community at large with our uh, MOASC listen, listen and Refer program. Um, so as I mentioned, we have, uh, and, and Joan mentioned, we have the pretest before the training and then we have a post-test after the training to look at um, their knowledge, um, understanding, and comfort level with, um, with make, uh, having conversations with um, other community members, students, peers, and their willingness to make referrals um, based on the training. And what's been very um, encouraging from the data is that um, uh, uh, significant increases in um, knowledge, um, of, of su uh, suicidal factors or um, factors of suicide, excuse me, um, and um, willingness um, to um, make referrals um, and also um, willingness to return back to the program when they have those questions or needs. So um, the data as far as the time one when they take the, um, the training from 
uh, the minute before they take the training to uh, 50, 40 minutes later after they take the tra training is very encouraging. Um, but we also want to do some follow-up evaluation as far as how well does this information stick. As Joan mentioned earlier, uh, with all the do work that we do with prevention, uh, sometimes we may only have one shot and a lot of times we'll do that as uh, presentations, but we're finding um, the more that we can have um, information disseminated in a format the students are and our community members are comfortable with and we can um, uh, disseminate that information broader in an uh, internet website fashion, the better of success we'll have. And, but, uh, but we also want to find out how long this information lasts. So we say one of the encouraging things is um, we find that the students do recall the information and do return back to the site. And a lot of times when you see this uh, three month, six month, and 12 month follow up, you typically see um, the, sl the, the numbers sloping down and we're not seeing that with this program. So that's encouraging. Uh, but we do want these numbers to increase. Just to give you a reference, um, the zero to 4.5 is based on a five point scale um, with zero being a none and five being very often. Now this data really surprised me and we're str still trying to make sense of it. However, the bottom line is it's very encouraging. When we look at how concerned students are about their community members, um, other students, if they have used Ask, List, and Refer, and would they be willing to refer, we find a very interesting phenomena happening between six months and 12 months. We're not exactly sure what's happening there, but it's good news. It may just be the fact that we think of a typical student that a lot of their um, life experiences change a lot in one year and that you might experience, uh, whereas let's just say that if you take this program as a first year student, you may have never had a contact with a friend who's um, been feeling really down or needing uh, mental health assistance, but by the end of the year you may experience that. Um, or it could be the fact that while these uh, follow-ups um, are evaluations, they're also reminders about the information. So we may be increasing our students' salience and awareness of these in, uh, this information. So the bottom line is we're not exactly sure what's happening here, but we're very encouraged and hoping as more students participate in Ask, List, and Refer and our community and statewide Mo Ask, List, and Refer, we can um, tease out more of the data and find out more the specifics about this good news. And I keep, I apologize, I keep banging into something back here. So our Missouri Ask, Listen, and Refer program, just to review, is free online suicide prevention program designed to help Missourians uh, prevent suicide by teaching them how to identify people at risk for suicide, recognize risk factors, protective factors, and warning signs, and respond to and get help for people at risk. And it currently serves any school, community agency, et cetera, that's interested in using the program. We'd be willing to partner with church groups, uh, faith-based organizations, um, civic organizations, et cetera. And this program is based on the college Ask, Listen, Refer training program that you've heard data about. And we've listed the website again. So the application for this program, why use a online suicide prevention training program to prevent suicide? What we know is that current, current efforts to train non-clinical personnel, those first responders, those friends, family members, partners, at college campuses on suicide um, often um, have been limited to in-person class presentations and that only reach those who are interested in being there and have a limited long-term impact on attendees. Um, and when we ask students, do you ever look for information online about a health topic that's hard to talk about, the, the Pew Internet and American Life Project said that many of our youth are looking online. And so therefore, based on the fact that people are going online to receive this information, they need to receive something often that is in the privacy of their own home. Suicide and mental health um, are certainly um, not taboo topics, but are something that many people prefer learning about in the privacy of their own home or in their own space. And given the fact that people are connected to the internet at many times throughout the day, often 24 hours a day. We know that uh, a program which combines those two, combines a way to get um, a training program to people in a delivery method in which they feel comfortable with, but also in a way that they can consistently come back to that does not simply just 
happen in a one hour period in a classroom and then leaves them. Um, that is why the Ask, Listen, Refer program is successful and seems to work well for us. Um, we know from a study that DRUM did in 2009 that two-thirds of those who disclosed their suicidal ideation first chose to tell a peer, such as a romantic partner, roommate, or friend. And almost no under, undergraduates and not a single graduate student in this study confided in a professor. While we believe that faculty are very important to understanding this issue and to, um, to providing the, the, reach, the reaching out point for many students, for the most part, we're wanting to target those people who are actually being met with these crises every day in our communities and in our colleges. Um, and although it's logistically more difficult to train students um, or the people that are really in the trenches, if you will, with our youth every day, such as our youth leaders, our Boy Scout leaders, our church youth group mentors, etc., it's likely a more efficient use of limited resources from a population-based perspective. Um, we are interested in shifting that paradigm from individual to problem-centered. Um, so we're looking more to addressing um, the suicide prevention that's happening um, in a, a more systemic way by training as many people as possible using limited resources in a way that really meets that person where they're at. Um, what we know from working on college campuses um, is that the entire administrative structure of the university, and we know this to be also true for, um, for schools and other community agencies, is that all parts of the structure need to be engaged with the problem of suicide, suicidal ideation uh, by intervening at all points along the continuum. Uh, prevention, early intervention, crisis treatment, and relapse prevention. And Ask, Listen, Refer is helpful in all of those stages. Um, what we're looking to do on our college campuses, and we encourage folks to do this in their communities as well, is to expand a dialogue around issues of suicide to include all stakeholders and not just those who are mental health counselors or those who know about mental health, but to really address policy issues on campus such as training um, or setting up a policy on training campuses and things like suicide prevention task suicide prevention task forces. We find that there are many community groups, churches, et cetera, that are interested in the issues of mental health and suicide prevention that might find this program useful. And certainly, it's available to them free of charge at any time. We've included a few resources for suicide prevention, including the uh, Department of Mental Health, the People Prevent Suicide um, website, which we have used, referenced um, in some of our training programs, um, and certainly the toolkit um, for high schools that we, uh, we looked at also when we were developing the MOAS Listen Refer program to make sure that there was information that is relevant to the uh, 9 through 12 grades um, because the program was originally written for, high, for college students. We've also included in this presentation, um, as this is also available in Missouri Ask, Listen, Refer, the crisis intervention hotlines in the state of Missouri. If you or someone you know um, is considering suicide or you're wanting to talk with someone about how to have that conversation, as well as the 1-800-TALK um, the number, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, um, which we promote quite widely in our campuses and in our communities. Now we'd like to open up the floor for any questions um, or if we need to review anything in the presentation. And we encourage people to use the chat box next to the video window to ask any questions, submit any feedback. I was curious as to whether you've seen any similar data gathered from other states or other college campuses or how this, is, how this has spread beyond, because I know this part of this is from SAMHSA, not just within the, not within the state. So what else have you seen? Uh, what we have seen is that um, we, the reason why we have multiple colleges outside of the state of Missouri reaching out to us is that um, there are training programs that are, that are very um, extensive training programs that are done in a person-by-person -person basis over one hour to 12 hours on many college campuses. And many campuses are finding those to be useful, but they're still not addressing the everyday college student that wouldn't necessarily walk into a suicide prevention training program or take 12 hours of their time on the weekend to learn about mental health. That um, what they're missing out on addressing the issue of how to help a friend 
for those everyday college students that aren't going to participate in those training programs, but would if they got a web link. And, oh, I'll try this out. This might be seem, seem useful or interesting. And so therefore, um, we have had multiple campuses who have Garrett Lee Smith Suicide Prevention Grants or others that are interested in spending um, a very small amount of money to purchase the program through us and use it annually as to be able to supplement what they're already doing because this meets a niche uh, on our own campus the University of Missouri we use the mental health first aid program we use the QPR program and then we also use the ask listen refer program and so they each meet a need uh, for a college campus that the other one necessarily does not and so that's what we're hearing at least from our campuses in the state and nationwide yeah, and I think we're very fortunate in the state of Missouri that we do, particularly on our college campuses, we do have access to the online brief um, education, uh, QPR training, and mental health first aid. So we've got a nice uh, broad range there. The other thing with the capacity with the um, partners in prevention with 21 campuses, we have the opportunity to aggregate data and get a large sample over several years um, to see not only what is the prevalence uh, of the issues we're concerned about, but have any of the education programs um, uh, showing, showing efficacy. Um, and with our uh, suicide prevention at this point, we've only been starting it and going for a couple of years, so we're seeing that the use is increasing, and we're really looking down the road to see what sort of efficacy these programs have and what impact they have. Um, so none of the numbers from our data is really all that strikingly different from some of the things that we see nationally, even with our target groups, but I think we have a better breadth of information in the state of Missouri to inform programming and um, provide information for evaluation. We are unaware of um, many states throughout the country that have a similar survey to the Missouri College Health Behavior Survey. There are some coalitions that um, do exist across uh, the country that maybe have a subpopulation that they survey or a few campuses in the state. Um, we, um, we often do technical assistance with other states in the country about how to implement something like the Missouri College Health Behavior Survey, and we're always available for, um, to reach out um, to do that, uh, that technical assistance as well. And there might be an opportunity to mention that uh, the uh, Missouri College Health Behavior Survey has provided, and, and the Partners in Prevention has provided the networking and collaboration that this year we've piloted um, a Missouri Student Veterans Association with a couple of pilot campuses and looking to get more information about the experiences of our student veterans and how we can assist them. Do you see any, any uh, downsides to having the program existing online like that? You know, I, what I've heard from some college campuses is that they, they don't necessarily see any downsides, but when they only have the program, uh, this is not like a silver bullet that someone would implement on their campus and then not be able to follow through on. They're still going to have to, when you go to the resources section of the website, if there's no resources to go to, it, it only becomes ask, listen. It's not ask, listen, refer anymore. And so um, they certainly, a downside to a campus to implementing this program is if they don't have anything in place then for these people who are being trained to then refer to or to go to if they need assistance. Um, and certainly um, we, at multiple times during the program, uh, if someone doesn't even want to log in, they can click on a page that tells them immediately what to do in case of an emergency. We designed that page so that no one in an emergency would feel like they have to click through slides to be able to get the information. Um, and additionally, um, we, mo we remind people, and that's the reason why we have the hotline underneath, is that this is not a program that someone would take in the event that they're actively suicidal. This is something for the friends of others who are are concerned about a person's behavior, or wanting to know if that might be something that they should continue to be concerned about, and then how to have a conversation about it. All right, well, I don't see any other questions rolling in at this point, so we're gonna wrap up today's presentation. Folks, as a, in the state of Missouri, we do an annual suicide prevention conference that comes up in the middle of July this year. So if you're anywhere near our state, you can uh, take a look at that. We'll have the information as it becomes available up on our website at mimhtraining.com. 
Also keep you apprised of that via email, as well as other programs like this that come up. We've got a lot of web conferences popping up on the schedule, and so stay tuned to the website for that as well. We'll keep the link to the CEUs open for a little while. We'll also send that and the uh, link to the PDF of the slides to you in a follow-up email, as well as uh, a link to an evaluation form for today's program. We encourage you to fill that out, give us your feedback, and also the kinds of topics of presentations you'd like to see in this format or any of the formats that we do. <coughs> so again, thank you for your time this afternoon. Dan Joan, thanks for your time too. Thank you. Thank you so much.